Okay, hi, good morning everyone. Welcome to the ECE Colloquium. Today we are very happy to have Professor Yang Liu uh, from UC Santa Cruz. He's an assistant professor in computer science and engineering there at UC Santa Cruz, uh, which he has joined since uh, 2018. And before that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University, and he got his PhD in EECS from uh, University of Michigan. Uh, his research interests are broadly in machine learning, and particularly on the topics of weekly supervised learning, and the very timely topic of algorithmic fairness, which, you, as, as you may know, has been very, very important in, uh, uh, in assessing the impact of machine learning models on societal applications and in society in general. Um, he has received a lot of awards, including the NSF Career Award, the NSF Fairness in AI Award as the lead PI, and um, he has been selected to participate in both DARPA and IRPA major projects. His recent papers have won uh, four Best Paper Awards at machine learning workshops, and today he will, and he's also involved in the IFDS, Institute for Foundations of Data Science, the UC Santa Cruz branch, which is related to the IFDS that we have here at, at UW, part of the bigger uh, Data Science Institute's grant. So we are very happy to welcome Yang, and he will be talking about agency bias in machine learning. So please join me in welcoming Yang. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. Hi. Thank, you, thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, this is Yang coming from Santa Cruz. I'm going to talk about bias in machine learning. And uh, part, of the, part of the work I'm, ta I'm going to talk about are funded by IFDS uh, effort led by Maria. So thank you. Um, among all the biases, I think I'm going to give you a, a broader introduction to the bias issues in machine learning. But then I'm going to converge to one bias, um, which I call the agency bias. Um, this has been my research focus for the past few years. I'm going to explain this to you. Just to put people on the same, same page, all, all, everything I'm going to talk about today is within the context of machine learning. And typically, when we think about machine learning, we have uh, three major components. We have data collections, most likely data coming from people. Um, the data will go into the training procedure. That's where the magic happens. And then after you got the model, you deploy, you serve the people, or you serve the application. A lot of discussions happen at the training. So that's the sort of the, uh, the focal points of this community. Like how do you do a good training procedure or how do you, do, how do you develop an algorithm to process the data in the best way? And uh, very much the discussions are accuracy driven. So you probably heard the term state of the arts a lot of times. Where the goal is trying to find a model that best describes this data. So this is the empirical risk minimization where the L is the loss function, trying to capture how well the model is. Uh, is working on this data. Okay, and uh, I think starting about uh, one of the first major conferences that has a lot of fairness papers were probably in Europe's uh, 2016. That's like six years ago. People start to look into other metrics that goes beyond the accuracy concerns. You know, there's a privacy concerns, security concerns, and then fairness concerns. So this paper shows that even though many facial recognition app, uh, models are commercialized, they do show disparate accuracies across people with different um, uh, skin colors. Okay. Uh, I think, I'm not sure this is readable, but this is about 10% of the difference in terms of eye recognition accuracy between darker skin people versus light skin people. And even later, some uh, more recent techniques. This one is a differential privacy powered deep, deep neural network training model. Um, we're the uh, DP was supposed to be adding additional protection of users' data in terms of privacy, but then this one is actually introducing new um, challenges of disparities when you're training this model. Similarly, pruning, um, quantizing, this is another popular technique in deep learning. It has, it has been shown to have some disparate impacts to the models too. Perhaps not surprising too, for many other learning tasks in addition to classifications, this is the sort of text image matching. This is our work that shows this strong gender biases in the, in the, search, pro, in the search process. Perhaps not really surprising, because there's, there's like stereotype in terms of associating occupation with different genders. So this happens in the, in the language models as well. Okay. Um, there has been, in the past few years, there, have been, there has been a lot of discussions in terms, in terms of how do we fix this question. There has been treatments being proposed fairness definitions, 
mathematical, mathematicalizing the fairness concepts so you can program, program them into the, into the training procedure. But uh, there was one debate that was, how do we attribute this observed bias? Right, so we observe, we observe these disparities, we observe the biases in the model. Do we attribute the bias to data or do we attribute the bias to the machine? Okay. So this is sort of a, the question that I was really interested in and uh, part of my research is highly motivated by this debate. Uh, the reason people have this debate, first of all, you know, this question is hard. Disentangling data bias from machine bias is very challenging. It's pretty hard to counterfactually reason, you know, what is the source of the bias when you're having this, uh, when you have this only observation from the model. Uh, but the second reason is also attributing or blaming on data bias is very convenient. Okay. Um, we, we know data is a new oil, but then data has different qualities. Um, we know machine learning is a garbage in, garbage out system. We also know no data is clean, but most is useful. That tells, that tells us sometimes, even though we know there's an issue in the data, but we have to rely on this data because that's the only access we have. So the takeaways are data quality matters. Machine learning can encode the quality of the bias in the data because it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, therefore, data bias does imply the uh, biased outputs. Okay, so attributing the observed bias to data bias is very convenient. Then there's a question of, is there really machine bias? Okay. Um, the typical argument for non-existence of machine bias is as follows. So I summarize using this example. Uh, imagine I'm doing this uh, probability course 101. Um, say I observe uh, 1,000 coin flips. This is my data. 600 hat, 400 tail. And uh, I ask you to estimate the biasness of the coin. Okay, so this is my data. And if I'm loyal to my data, I'm gonna predict 60%. This is gonna be head, 40% gonna be tail, if I follow the frequencies uh, aspects. So in this case, why would I predict anything that is close to 50-50? Why would I claim this is a fair in terms of head and tail? Right, the data tells us this is 60-40, and we do machine learning, we should say 60-40. Well, the first possibility is that what if the model predicted 70-30? Okay. The model is not predicting 60-40, it's neither predicting 50-50, but the model is actually predicting 70-30. That points out to the first machine bias, I think that was relatively easier for people to catch up uh, in the earlier days, which is not only machine learning can encode the bias and noise in the data, but it can also amplify them. Okay. So this is the first layer of uh, the possible biases from machine learning. Uh, part of me, part of my earlier time has been devoted to this question of, uh, you know, how do machine learning amplify the biases or noise in the data? Uh, I think Maria mentioned that there's a community called weekly supervised learning. Uh, the community has done a lot of fascinating works in terms of understanding what if there's noise in the data, what are the harms, and what are, what are the solutions? So I, I did spend a lot of time to work on this so-called label bias issues. What if the training labels has biases? How do you do this? Uh, I'm gonna skip this, okay? This is not gonna be the focus of today, but um, the short answer is yes. So if you have a systematic bias in a label, the algorithms can pick up on the difference and, re and reinforce the biases in the data. Similarly, the other type of bias is called population bias. If there's a population bias in terms of uh, different patterns or different data, distributed in an imbalanced way. This, uh, in, this, in this figure, the data is distributed in a highly long tail way, then this imbalance can be picked up by the machine learning models as well. Okay. So we have uh, results to show this is uh, like many popular algorithms like some supervised learning is particularly vulnerable in this setting. Okay. But I want to focus on the second type of bias today. Again, using this example, then the question is, still, you have 1,000 flips, 600 head, 400 tail. But what if I tell you there were actually 200 flips that were not recorded well? Okay. So it turns out, counterfactually, it should be 600 head, 600 tail, but you just didn't collect the 200 of them. That leads to this biased observation or collection of data. So why this is happening? I would actually argue this happens a lot on a daily basis. When you think about using machine learning to, um, to 
send recommendations. Think about Netflix, right? Basically, the data you're observing today, the user activity data you're observing today, are generated under the intervention of the recommendation model you deployed last month. Okay? If the model didn't really serve one group of users really well, highly likely this group of users will leave the platform or become inactive, and this will affect your data collections in the next month or next year. Okay? This is corresponding to this selection bias in, uh, in, in machine learning. Similarly, in the financial applications, uh, if you keep denying people from one group, you're never going to observe their qualification, right? Like for the bank, you only observe, you only track people who qualified, who didn't pay back for the people you approved or for the people you, you, you approved the credit card or gave the loans. You never have the data of the tracks of the people you never approved, so on and so forth. So the second bias I'm going to focus on is that not only machine learning can be um, reinforcing the bias, but it can be a bad reinforcement that creates data bias. Okay. And let's take a closer look of why this is happening. And I think the fundamental reason this is happening is because this argument of machine learning having three components is overly simplified. Okay. So this is the, this is the uh, components I was showing you earlier. But in reality, once you deploy the model, okay, so once you deploy the model here, people will react or people will respond to your model. As I said, in the recommendation settings, if you are underserving a community of users, these users will leave. Okay? So this user will exit. This will give you a very different population of data. Some other times, um, people may adapt. Okay? Imagine you're the bank. You're trying to build a classifier here. Say, uh, this is really simple applications. I'm using four features, income, education, depth, savings, and I'm using a linear classifier to combine the coefficients um, to make the final decision. And if this is the case, and if the bank published this policy as a user, suppose this is my current profile. I have a 6,000 income, I have a college degree, I have 40, 40 key depth, I have 20 key saving. This is my current applications, and I realize you're putting a lot of weights on depth. Before I send my application, I might try to reduce my debt in order to get a better chance of being approved. Okay? That is corresponding to this delayed effects. Once, once, you de once you deploy the classifier, you should be expecting some of the behaviors or some of the changes from the users. And either way, this will go to, um, this will lead to a different population. Okay? And will challenge the performance of your models. And not only so, this, challenge, this, this highly shifting distribution will flow back into a training, and it will affect the training of the next version of the classifier, so on and so forth. And by closing, closing this loop, whatever bias that happens here is going to be encoded or memorized into the system. Okay, so this is the agency bias I'm going to talk about. I'm going to show you what can go wrong if this uh, whole system is highly dynamical and there's a feedback loop of it. The first bias I'm going, this first specific bias example I'm going to tell you is, uh, which I summarize as the Goodhart's law in machine learning. A one-page summary of why this bias happens, uh, I think the Goodhart's law summarizes this pretty well. The original version of the Goodhart's law is that when, good, when measure becomes a good measure, it ceases to be a good measure. A typical example would be the p-values, right? When the science community promoted p-values, we know what happened. There were a lot of p-hacking happens. Uh, there's an extremely imbalanced distribution of p-values centered around 0.05 because that's a value to get your paper published. Um, similarly, in machine learning, which I rephrase that, when a model becomes a good model, it ceases to be a good model. Okay? When you get this data, you got the training down, and you deploy this model, but once the model is public or is deployed, you're going to face a lot of manipulations or adaptations or reactions. And these reactions from the people is going to create a very different distribution compared to the training distribution you're using. And this will immediately challenge all the guarantees you had for the machine learning model. Okay. To formalize this, uh, this discussion, I need to talk about what is the model we are using and what are the reactions we are talking about. Suppose I'm actually fully aware of the fairness issues. I'm going to train a fair classifier on my data. So 
how do I do this? A typical way of training a fair classifier is nothing too different from, it, from training a classifier. The goal is still trying to minimize the, uh, the errors of the classifier on the training data, but uh, the only difference is that I'm going to impose a constraint. So I'm trying to say, I'm going to get the best classifier, but it should be equalizing some fairness measures across different groups. Right? So in this notation, I'm using the S to denote the sensitive attributes or people coming from different groups. I'm using the fair to denote a measure that tells me this is the quantity or this is the measure I care about in terms of fairness. And uh, typical examples include the uh, demographic parities. Suppose uh, the one decision is a favorable decision. Suppose one corresponding to being approved. The, this fair is indicating how many positive decisions you offered to a group of users. Okay. How many loans you approved, how many credit cards you approved for this particular group of people. Uh, but there's some other accuracy rating measures too, equal opportunities. This fair measure will be corresponding to the true positive rates of the classifier achieved across different people. So in all, this is a constraint optimization question. Okay, so this is a classifier we are getting. So how do people respond? Turns out that this community has prepared tools to model responses, and partly this is borrowed from the EconCS communities or the game theoretical communities. The basic idea is to model the agents as being self-interested and being strategic and best responding. The idea is, again, imagine I'm the bank. I'm trying to um, build a classifier to approve the loan applications. And this is a basically a two-stage game. So the, the bank is the first player. I'm publishing my classifier. This is here, but the, once the agent see this classifier, it will strategically think about what is the best action I can do to maximize my chance of being approved. So this is a very game theoretical issue of thinking. Um, agents' utility are motivated by two reasons. First of all, I want to modify my features, or I want to modify my data such that my chance of being approved is going to be maximized. But at the same time, I want to, uh, I dro sorry, I dropped a word here. I want to make sure the change is not incurring too much of a cost. Right? If the change asks me to you know, increase my salary by five times, probably this is too costly for me to follow the changes. So you want to find a change that gives you the best um, utilities. To summarize, we can think about the agents or the, the people who are holding the data X are going to solve the following optimization questions. This is utility U that tells you what is the utility of you moving from feature X to X prime. Okay. And in this particular example, it will be depending on what's the classification outcome of the new feature X prime minus how much cost you incurred by making this change. To give you an illustration, so suppose this is a 2D classification question. Um, this is the decision boundary, the dashed line. Everything below is uh, classified as positive. You pass the classification. Everything above is denied the application. So suppose I'm the user here. The question for me is, what is the shortest path for me to get to the decision boundary, to be reclassified as being positive? So that's basically what the optimization question is trying to solve. Okay. So in this setting, what are, what are the possible issues, or what, what are the possible biases? Right? So you have the fair classifier. You have agents responding. So what can go wrong? So the first bias I'm going to talk about is what I call the fairness reversal. Okay? Imagine, again, this is a toy example, 2D classifications, x1, x2, the features. Um, the crossings here are the uh, positive labels. Okay? So each of the crossings are positive labels, and each of the circle here is a negative label. Okay? Binary classification, really easy. And the green line is a linear classifier, I promise you. So this is a classifier I'm going to use to classify people. I color the data in different colors. So the blue data comes from one group, and the red data comes from another group. If you trust my calculation, this classifier actually achieves perfect fairness. It's actually making the same amount of mistakes for both groups. It has the same accuracies. It has the same positive predictions across different groups. Okay. It seems to be fair. But now imagine I'm a user here who was rejected. I'm on, I'm on the bottom half here. But I realize I'm actually pretty close to the decent boundary. And by increasing my monthly income by $3,000, I can actually cross the decent boundary and get approval. And this will be corresponding to 
for example, the three data points on the top. Imagine these three points, they are relatively closer to the discern boundary. They find out that it's relatively easier for us to make the change, get approved, and they will take the changes. And therefore, immediately at the reality or at the test time, the classifier is facing a very different distribution, in which case it was fair on the training data, but now it has 100% accuracy for the, for the blue group, but the same 70-ish accuracy for the red group. So the fairness guarantee is reversed. And this reversal behavior is not only observed in this toy example. We can formally prove this, but also in real-world data by simulating these agent models, we observe similar stuff. Uh, in this panel, I'm basically showing you the experiments we did on three data sets. This is adult data predicting the income, crime data predicting the high crime rates, um, law school predicting the, the chance of students passing the, exam, the bar exams. Um, on the X axis, I'm showing you a budget, like how much uh, cost you can, you can take in order to make changes. So this is a normalization factor, uh, not important. On the Y axis, this is unfairness measures, measuring the sort of the accuracy difference between different groups. So the higher the value is, the more unfair the situation will be. In each of the data set or each of the figure, I am showing you two curves. So the blue curve is the fair classifier. So this is FF. This is a fair classifier that has fairness guarantees. You know, this is a constraint optimizations. It has fairness, it has fairness promise on the training data. Um, well, the dash line, this black curve, is corresponding to a baseline classifier. I do nothing. I'm not aware of the fairness. I just train the best model on this data. Okay? So theoretically, this fair classifier should be have a smaller gap or smaller unfairness compared to the baseline classifier. But this is not what, what we observe. Um, all three data sets we actually observe, there exist some parameter regions of the manipulation budget such that this fair classifier, in fact, incurred a much higher unfairness as compared to the baseline models. I think this is a pretty alarming message. You know, everything was promised to be fair on the training data, but in reality, once you deploy it, this classifier can actually become more unfair as compared to the baselines. So what caused this uh, fairness reversal? This is the same figure I showed you earlier in a different plot. Um, again, the unfairness and manipulation budgets. On the top, I'm actually showing you the discernible boundaries. Okay? So in this control experiments, I'm only, in terms of, in order to realize, I'm only using two, fe two features uh, for each of the data sets. And um, each of the dots is representing a data in the database. And the shaded region represents the positively classified data points from a classifier. Okay. For example, this uh, yellow shaded region represents like where, what, are the, what are the data that has been classified as being positive from the fair classifier. And the blue region represents the region of data being predicted as positive from the baseline classifier. Okay. So in this three example, we show in the first two data, there's a fairness reversal. Okay. So this this yellow, this yellow curve, which is corresponding to the fair classifier, has a higher unfairness. Um, the last one, there's no fairness reversal. So this is ideal. The fair classifier indeed has a smaller unfairness. Okay. The reason I'm adding these three is just to make a comparison easier. Okay. The first two had this reversal bias. The last one does not. So what's the difference in the discern boundary? So we do observe for the first two, when you have this fairness reversal, the fair classifier being more unfair in practice is highly correlating with uh, the discern boundary is smaller or the positive region is smaller. In other words, the fair classifier is more selective. You are approving less people into the system. You are selecting less people from the applications. Okay, so this is, uh, this is given by the, uh, the region of the yellow is uh, much smaller than the region of blue same story here, but in the last figure, the region of yellow, which is given by the fair classifier, is actually much larger than the blue region, less selective. And we do prove selectivity is the key to this observation. Uh, if I denote two sets of data, xc, uh, 
this is a data point that, ha that is being classified as positive by the baseline classifier. XF, this is set of data being classified as positive by the fair classifier. And we call the fair classifier being more selective if this XF is a subset of XC. Okay. So this is our definition of being selective. Under this definition, we actually proved, okay, so uh, we do have a multi-dimensional generalization, but for this results, imagine one dimensional data and uh, I'm using a threshold classifier to make the classification. So in this case, if we are using the demographic parities, true positive risk, false positive risk as your fairness measure, and if the cost is monotonic in terms of how much you're changing, which is pretty much reasonable, um, if the fair classifier is, the threshold of the fair classifier is higher, meaning it's more selective, then there always exists a situation or the scenario such that the fairness reversal will happen. Okay. So this is the first observation we, ha we had, like why causes this fairness reversal, this, this reversal bias in practice. Now, the second cause we look into is sort of uh, trying to think about why in this previous example we talk about the reversal happened is because those three users responded, but then the question is why some users were not responding? You know, what happened at this corner? Okay. So this is another reason um, we thought that might be interesting to this observation. And it turns out if we look at the people who are not responding, there's a deeper connection or there's a deeper reasoning um, compared to these this differences in the statistical measures. And um, the deeper reason here is that many models are actually not flexible enough to allow people to respond. Why this is the case? So we formalized this study called, using this notion of recourse, which described the ability to obtain a desired prediction from a model by changing actionable input variables. So imagine you're the bank again, you deny the people's applications. Not only you want to give people explanations, you also want to be flexible enough such that if people take actions to improve, they should be reconsidered. And we think this is actually very important in terms of uh, establishing the trustworthiness between users and the machine learning model because if the model does not allow people to respond, where the model provides no recourse, will dodge the possibility for agents to make positive changes, this will lead to drop in the long-term qualifications. Right? If this is the case, as long as this model is deployed, there's one group of users, they will be trapped in this low social economic status, they will never get this approved. And as I said, this question is trickier than explaining the models. There has been a lot of discussions in terms of interpreting deep learnings, explaining deep learnings, but then the question here is actually trickier because you can offer explanations such as, you know, your age is too high for these applications combined with your rest of features, but you cannot recommend the change of uh, decreasing your age. This is not actionable. But rather, ideally, you want to tell people increase your income by $5,000. This is more actionable. Similarly, uh, we, had a, we had a collaboration with TikTok, you know, in recommendation systems. When you have inactive users, you don't want to recommend arbitrary things to people to watch, but rather you want to consider feasibilities. You want to recommend things for people that is relatively more feasible for people to explore. Only by doing that, you're going to see responses from people. So, Ideally, the model, we think in order to remove this agency bias in responding, we think the model should be preparing a flip set for people. In terms of, you give me the model, I tell you, okay, so this is your previous uh, profile. You, you had zero most, pay, most recent payment. How about you change it to 800? Then the chance of uh, being approval is going to be much higher. Or you didn't really pay full in the last six months, but what if you paid four months in full in the last six months, then the chance of being approved will be higher. So we want to give this table to people to recommend um, healthy and actionable changes. Yet, we do realize a fair model, again, trend with the fairness constraints and everything, does not always provide recourse for these actionable changes because many variables people use um, 
are not really actionable. I think I give you some examples already, but then these are real examples too. There has been reports saying personality types, you know, correlates with the creditworthiness of uh, of the of the applicants, but then you cannot re really recommend the change of this this attributes. Um, Education levels, this is uh, actionable, but only in one way. You can recommend people getting a PhD, but not undo the PhD. Um, some other things are changeable, like your phone type, your martial status, but uh, we think this is not really ethical to recommend people to change just because of the application. Okay. And when we, when we try to think about the solutions, there are also many real world challenges, uh, including, I think, I was talking to Mariam earlier, there's many real world manipulations that can happen. We actually have conversations with banks. Banks are extremely worried about the possible manipulations. What if we make the model too flexible, then people will start to you know, misreport slightly in their application and then manipulate the, the applications. But also, sometimes the, the changes may be too drastic for people to even accept. Increase your income by $10 million, of course you'll be qualified, but then this is not really affordable for people to to, to action on. So what can we do? Okay, so there's a line of work, including some of the works from Mariam and also other researchers at UW. Um, they have been trying to build a solution based on this notion of predicting the what if question. So if we can predict the what if question, we know what if we deploy this model, this is going to happen, potentially you can impose or you can enforce your optimization on this what if distribution. Okay. So this is one way to go. Uh, but I just want to briefly, briefly mention some of the ongoing effort we had, which is on certification. Okay. So we don't want to solve the question entirely, but as a first step, can we provide a certification that tells people we know the distribution is going to be different from the training? Can we add a certification that tells people how much fairness guarantee are going to transfer to the whatever unobserved distribution in practice. So what, what do we do here? The basic idea is that you have a source distribution on the training and you have a target distribution you don't really know because that's based on, that's only observed after you deploy the model. But we can potentially build something to guess or to predict what's the difference, what's the distances between these two distributions. Okay, so this D here is a divergence, you can think about this as a divergence function, KL or other divergence functions that captures that, you know, these two distributions are bounded by some parameter B. Now, suppose I achieved bounded fairness guarantees on the source distribution on the training data. So pi here is a classifier's policy. Can we guarantee that, you know, at most, the fairness violation is going to be bounded by some quantity? So if we can do this, at least we can inform the policymakers or we can inform the, um, the designer. You know, at the worst case, this can happen. If the quantity is bounded at a relatively smaller quantity, so I think it's relatively safe to claim this model is good to go, but if we ever show this guarantee is at a much higher level, then um, this is gonna raise some caution. We have two um, forthcoming paper at NeurIPS next month, uh, next week to discuss this, uh, this line of uh, research on certification. Similarly, we also provided a, a certification toolkit for recourse. The basic idea is that if you give me the model, it gives me the data from users, it gives me the preference from the users in terms of, you know, I want to take this action, maybe changing my income is easier than changing my education level. We can put everything into the optimization question, trying to find what is the shortest way, what is the cheapest actions you can take in order to fit your decisions. Okay. I'm gonna skip the details, but basically based on this one, we're gonna either tell people, you know, this is the action you can follow to flip your decision, or we're gonna certify that there's no recourse for these users, or there's nothing the user can do. Therefore, the model is going to be um, relatively concerning. I think I'll pause here in case there's a question. That's the first part of the bias I want to talk about. Mariam. Uh, what are the optimization variables? Oh, right, so let me explain this. The optimization variable is basically, I'm trying to minimize the cost of my recommendations. And uh, the rest of the, this constraint is telling you by taking this action, you should be able to flip the decision of the model. Okay, 
and the rest are just checking the feasibilities. You know, this is, should be respecting the changes should be only on the directions that are actionable, and uh, the total cost should be, you know, minimized in some sense. And everything is an integer programming uh, question because it's discretized, and then the directions are pretty much uh, pre-specified. So these are the variables. The rest are characters. Yes, the, sort of the these are variables. Yes, exactly. Yes. So how do we determine the weights or let's say the significance of different features? It's like, for example, we have to do a PhD to MPhD or right. it's like, um, you know, uh, increase our income. So that will be a, a much more weight than other features. So right. How do we determine right. That? Yeah, that's a great question. I think let me rephrase the question. The question is like, how do we know the preference of the people, right? Like in, in terms of, do I change my education level or do I increase my income? That's a great question. So. Typically, we think about that there's an interactive procedure in terms of preference elicitation. We got, that's where this part is. We got to ask people, 30 people, you know, among these two actions, which one do you prefer, okay? So this is one way to do this. Um, but in this work, we do ask a lot of more questions in terms of to what degrees do you prefer this action to other question. I think this is active research, um, super relevant to HCI type studies, like how do you design this interface to solicit the best information from people? Very good question. Um, how do you actually account for the fact that certain parameters could be linked to your input data? For example, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering, how do you account for the fact that certain parameters in your input data could be linked? For example, if I have a higher education, my income could potentially be on a higher. Right, right. Yeah, that's a great question. So this question is talking about what if the features are correlating in some ways, right? So if I were able to sort of increase my education level, very likely my salary will increase as well, right, at large. So that's a great question. This paper, we didn't do this. So in this, in this results, we didn't consider the, the correlation among features. So the features are entirely disentangled. But in the follow-up paper, it hasn't been published, but it's online. This paper, we do consider the correlation between features, right? So if you increase one feature, then the other feature is likely to be changing as well. So yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's very, that's very practical. Yes. I guess in these models, you're talking about situations where you'd like to have a flexible, uh, flexible uh, situation, but are there reasons that you'd like to make your model very rigid? not have people be able to game the system, let's say? Right, right, yeah, that's, that's another great, great question. So the question is that, uh, what are the, sort of, my understanding is like, what are the trade-off, or what is the balance or equilibrium points in terms of, uh, there are cases you want the model to be robust, right? You don't want manipulations, but on the other hand, I'm telling people, I'm telling you guys, the model should also be flexible, okay? So I tend to think about, uh, Ultimately, uh, we need tools from, uh, from causal inference. If we know which are the factors that are causes to the, to the true qualification variable Y, which are the correlational factors, then we can potentially decouple these objectives, right? So the goal would be we want to keep flexible on the causing factors, the causes, because these are the causes of the true qualification. We want people to make changes in the causes so their qualification can improve but we want to make sure the correlational factors are robust. People cannot manipulate on the uh, correlational factors. But you know, this opens up a whole different question, like how do you even know which factors are causing, which factors are correlating? But yeah, great question. I think I have 10 minutes-ish. The second example I want to give is nothing really different. It's a small extension of the first thing I mentioned. I think you got the basic idea. The bias is, is happening, the agency bias is happening because the agents have agency, right? You deploy the model, the agencies are at the hand of the agents. They can respond. That will lead to different kinds of uh, bias observations in the training. Um, and as you can imagine, this interaction can go for multiple steps. It does not need to be immediate reactions. You deploy the model, I respond, okay, that was the thing I talked to, I talked to you earlier. But in reality, we often observe a repeated interaction between agents and models. In recommendation systems, uh, many platforms, don't, don't quote me, um, probably many platforms are updating their models on a weekly basis or even daily basis, okay? So 
Now you deploy a model, you change, you intervene on the distribution of users, you got a new set of data, you, you re-update the model, you deploy, you get another set of data, and then you keep doing this. So the whole interactions are continuing uh, over time, uh, possibly at, at a much higher frequency. And this part of study is, again, reflecting on this figure. I I, sort of the first part of agency is focusing on this part, but then this second example is really on this dynamics. This whole loop is going to continue for a much longer period of time, and how do you model this, okay? I tend to use a graph to capture the interactions. Um, this, set of, this set of variables are for a time t, and then this t plus one, okay? At each time t, you have some unobserved uh, variables you're, you're trying to predict, but you observe the features, okay? So in this figure, I think relevant to the previous question, one is the cause and one is the correlation, okay? But your, your classifier is going to make a decision based on these observed features. This is the typical classification settings. But the interaction happens at, when you give the decisions, this decision will intervene on the data generation and next time step. Okay? If, you give data, if, if you give money to this one group of users as a loan, potentially this group of users will develop themselves financially, and th therefore their repayment, the, the chance of repaying it will be higher. So this is corresponding to changes of the changes to the qualification variables. So on and so forth, if you give the loan to the people, they will use the money, for example, to enroll in college, they will change their education profiles. So this red arrows are representing these interactions. And now we're at T plus one, then everything repeats. You're gonna be at T plus two, then T plus three, so on and so forth. Okay. To recap the settings, we have two group of people, A and B, we have time variant features, so I'm gonna use subscript XT to denote the data, YT2, binary classifications, one qualified, zero not qualified. Um, I'm making an assumption here, that is uh, the generation of the feature follows a sort of a label shift settings or target shift settings. That is, given the true label Y, given the group attributes, the distribution of X, this is time invariant. Okay, so the X distribution given the true label Y, this is not changing. The only thing that is changing is a fraction of uh, positively qualified people. Okay. And I'm going to denote this as alpha as a, as a prior of so how many people were qualified in this population. So combine these two, you can really think about each of the population is modeled as a mixture of populations. You have some baseline populations, they don't really change but the mixture parameters, that is changing based on the interaction. I think this is definitely a simplification, um, allows us to do a lot of analysis, otherwise we need to track the entire population, the density function, the density function of the data, but now we are allowed to focus on the single parameter for each group. Okay. This is definitely a simplification. Nonetheless, uh, I think this assumption observed applications in the literature, this is often referred to as a target shift or label shift, because the label distribution is shifting, but then the conditional distribution x given y, this is not really shifting. <coughs> As a matter of fact, we have this, uh, we tested this uh, hypothesis on new census data that has a time shifting. It turns out that this is not a bad assumption. So the data is pretty much respecting this model. Based on this one, we can measure so sort of we propose a bias measure that captures the differences between group A and B in terms of uh, how many people are qualified in each of the group. <coughs> okay. And this will be the bias, bias measure we care about. So we are interested in answering, if we deploy a system for long enough, what is the qualification disparities between two, this group of people? To recap, so you have the classifiers. Think about a threshold classifier. After you deploy the classifier, this is a policy, depends on how well people receive the policy, depends on the utility people receive, they're gonna take actions. These this actions or these responses will lead to the dynamical change of the qualifications. Right? So this is the, the flow of the interaction. Now, so one thing we need to uh, answer the question is like in the sequential settings, how do you model people's response? 
So the agents are sequentially and actively interacting with the environments. How do you model the, the growth or the drop of the population? And we're pretty much inspired by this notion or this philosophy in evolution theory. So in evolution theory, there's a theory that captures or that explains why at a particular time, at a particular location, some species, some species population were growing as compared to others are dropping. Okay. And one of the theory was that the, the growth or the drop is depends on this imitation behavior. So the animals or the agents, they imitate each other. The reason they move to a particular location is because they look around, they realize, okay, my peers were able to succeed at this location and thrive. So the chance of me moving to this location will be higher. So this is the basic idea of evolution to model the change of populations. I think this is also likely to be happening on the internet platforms. If you think about the users are the agents that are thinking about should I use the system or should I leave the system? And the, the notion of imitating is also based on how well I'm fitting into the environment, which is provided by the model. And one particular mathematical tool in evolutionary theory is uh, replicator dynamics. This is a model that's trying to say why some population is replicating and why some population were dying out. And the, the basic notion is that the animals or the agents adopting, adopting a strategy or moving to a location depends on the fitness. If they really feel I'm, I'm pretty comfortable or I'm fitting into the environments, the chance of me moving into the region will be higher. So mirroring in our setting, that is to say, how many people will take the action to become qualified? If you look at this like population change in terms of qualified people in each population, this will depend on the utility of becoming qualified. Okay? To give an example, this will tell you the fitness of the group. To give you an example, suppose I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm trying to become a farmer, I'm trying to get a loan to buy land and also buy equipments. Um, if I realize becoming a farmer, you know, by taking classes, by taking courses, trainings, as, and buying equipments, is really going to make me qualified, and the classifier is also classifying me correctly, my utility will be higher because I become qualified, people approve me, so my utility will be higher. As compared to if I really spend efforts becoming a qualified farmer, but then um, the classifier misclassifies me, gives me, gives me no loan, then my fitness or my utility will be lower, in which case uh, less people will choose to go become a farmer or become a qualified farmer in this neighborhood. So that's the basic the intuition of the, of the population change. Okay, um, we're running out of time. So to summarize, based on this model, we are able to characterize the uh, stable points of the qualifications. This is a parameter we're trying to keep track on. And uh, based on the equilibrium notion, we can define the long-term disparities, the, the biases at the equilibrium, at the, at the stable points. And we do show that disparity, so as a bad news, disparity persists. So as long as the users has initial differences in the qualification race, the difference is going to persist when you are using, whenever you're using classifier that maximize short-term matters. Okay, so what are the short-term matters? Accuracies and even fairness matters. So even if you are trying to be fair at the current moment, it does not resolve this long-term bias. Um, Second to last figure, to give you an example. Um, so this is a theorem and the figure we showed. So this is a classifier, what we call the group independent classifier. So this is the best classifier we can train at each single step. So every step T, we train the best classifier, we deploy it. And this shows the evolution of the qualification rates of group one and group two. And the errors are showing you, like at this moment, if the classifier is deployed, what's the change, what is the direction of the change of the qualification rates? So what's the important, okay. yeah. what's important here is that the y equals x line, this is the equal qualification line. So we regard this line as being fair. If you're close to this line, it means your the qualification rates are relatively similar across different groups. But we observe that as long as you start from a, like a, from a different qualification point, they're always going to go parallel with the equal qualification line. So no matter how long you run the system, there's always gonna be disparities within the system or the bias in the system. So long-term bias is pretty hard to resolve. Um, 
One last thing I want to talk about, we talk about the whole system as a feedback loop system, but then this is effectively a control system. I think this is a very, very much a popular topic in, uh, in, in the EC departments. But again, the same picture again, but you can think about the actions are the classifiers you're deploying, the states of the, the control system are the data distribution of the users, therefore your actions are corresponding to the control actions. So based on the classical control theory, we can ask the question to what directions we should perturb the actions or the classifier so we're gonna control the system to converge to a fairer status. So things we can do, not easy, but doable. I'll skip this one. Quickly summarizing with, with, uh, with takeaways. So if you want to take one thing away from this talk, I hope it's gonna be the first one. That is, there is mission bias. I'm hoping the couple examples I showed you earlier were convincing enough uh, in terms of the existence of mission bias. But also I want to highlight the, uh, the importance of thinking about user-centric machine learning, which requires rethinking the training objectives. You know, accuracy only is not going to uh, lead us uh, the ultimate solutions for the long term. And we talk about agency bias. And uh, one thing we haven't fully resolved is user modelings. I think, I think I've got several, several questions already. How do you model the preference from the users? How do you model the responses from the users? Um, and these are, these are all important questions in terms of understanding the dynamical, really think about our algorithmic environments or the algorithmic system as a highly, highly dynamical um, ecosystem. And uh, how do we strive for the long-term fairness um, so we don't really sort of, uh, um, I, don't want to say, I don't want to say cheat, but sort of uh, we don't want to make fake promise. You know, we are fair, you know, even though myopically, but there's a, there's a bigger concern in terms, in terms of what's going on in the future. With that, I'm gonna stop here. Um, thank SM Minis for questions. Okay, thank you very much for the excellent talk. Are there any questions? You can raise your hand and we'll have your question repeated up front. Yes, sir. Do you, do you start to think of it as a control problem? It feels like the number, the system size, or the number of parameters that you have to control for gets really, really big. You know, so like have you, how deep have you gone down this path and what are mm -hmm. the problems? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I don't fully uh, hear the question, but my understanding is that it's like when you're designing this uh, sort of a, interaction with the environments, there are many, many factors. You know, there's a, even in, um, endogenous factors, exogenous factors, like economic situation, right? Like, you know, ec economy can go down in no time. We're never gonna predict this. Uh, economic factors and uh, also personalized uh, factors, preferences. Um, yes, so these factors, they can all factor into this study. Um, this modeling, we had is definitely a only a starting point, right? So, but you can imagine you're gonna keep adding. You you could keep adding variables, either observed or unobserved, to model the dynamics. Uh, it's gonna be complicating the studies, but um, doable in terms of uh, in terms of like reinforced learning. If you're using like more model-free models to capture dynamics and to to offer interventions, that's doable. But, um, but then the same question as in causal inference, there's always hidden confounding variables you can never, you can never know. So tricky, but really important questions. Any other questions? Yes. I'm curious about sort of the setup for um, the like budget for manipulating mm -hmm. um, the manipulating certain features, it seems like certain things are pretty easy to change, like in the example you gave where you have $10,000 of savings and some yeah. debt that you could pay off, that yeah. would be a really easy thing to do. Yeah. Uh, whereas like, it's a lot harder to go out and get a different job. Is there some sort of like structure to the cost that right. um, you know, it, not only is it like keeping track of what things are actually actionable, but like what's the degree, the degree of how right. actionable that, these That's a great are. question. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great question. Um, I think that's actually one of the 
the key question that stopped this methodology from being deployed in practice. Uh, I think the question is regarding like to what degree we can quantify this cost to model the, the, the preference of individual directions. Um, it's tough. So technically speaking, the function C, as long as the C is complicated enough, it can capture everything you're, you're talking about, right? So C can be defined on each dimensions and can even define over across dimensions. Um, but, but if you want to get this like really, really accurate C, you need to solicit a lot of information from the people, which is not doable. Uh, in our recent work, we talk about you can try to solicit preferences, like asking, I think this is similar to the sort of the ranking literature. You don't ask people the complete list of items, but you ask people between A and B, which one do you prefer? I think there's an opportunity of uh, sort of, by asking people this binary and the simple questions, we were able to reconstruct a full preference function across different actions. That's a hope. But um, in practice, it's really hard to agree with you. In terms of like the optimization, does it matter how complicated this function is? Does the cost need to be like convex, for example, or is uh, it, does it does that come into the to the solution of this sort of problem? It does. So it does. Um, not only so the literature not only requires this function to be convex. Many often um, the existing results require this cost function to be separable in terms of uh, this uh, x. The cost from x to x prime has to be written as the function of x prime minus the function of x, um, which further simplify things. But yeah, um, complexity matters in this case as well. I think this is the major assumption that people are not, people are not okay with. Um, but there's some progresses, as I said, preference-based uh, elicitation. That's one way to go. Um, machine learning approach is trying to regress based on the data, how to regress this function. That's another way to automate it. So you mentioned that in determining the C function, part of what you could look at is you know, offering users uh, binary choices, asking which one they prefer to gain an idea of their preferences. Uh, to what extent could that be manipulated by users who are like acting dishonestly to try to get like a more favorable position? Because like you can't necessarily apply, or you can't necessarily lie about like your income or educational level because it's easy to find out you know, whether that's true or not. But mm. in matters of preference, you could just try to you know, sculpt this fake image of who you are uh -huh. uh, to be like, you know, as desirable as possible right. to get the right. application or whatever. That, that's a great question. I think the question is about incentives, like why we are trusting that we're soliciting. Because sort of this is a chicken egg question, right? We're soliciting information from users, and then this information will be used to design the service for the users. So there's a possibility of a user manipulating to uh, get a better outcome. I think that's possible. Um, we don't have the theory. So that's a definitely a possibility that came across our minds. But our intuition was, in this case, it's actually likely to be incentive compatible because our system basically guarantees that if you give us your preference, our system is going to be loyal to your preference. We are going to find the best action according to our preference. So in that way, if you misreport your preference, that you're going to be recommended action that is closer to the manipulated preference. Because in this system, there's no um, money or there's no financial incentive involved. It's all recommendations. Right? So in the recommendation system, I think the incentives are pretty much aligned. You want the best recommendation for yourself. Um, so yeah, but we, that's a great question. We haven't closed the loop. We, don't, we haven't really proved this. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Yang again for the great talk. Thanks. Thank you all.